Okay, we've been talking about change. Change. Uh, we all like change when it's our idea, and we don't like change when it's somebody else's idea. So, change. Sometimes we change because something outside of us causes the change. And sometimes we change because something inside of us compels us to change. Would you agree to that? So let me give you an example. Um, <clears throat> two and a half years ago, I, I retired. And, uh, and nine months after I retired, uh, our garage caught on fire. And uh, it, uh, it damaged more than half the house, okay? And it took about a year and a half to get back into the house, all right? That is a change from outside of our lives that causes us to change. We, we didn't live in our house until just about uh, September. We moved in on September, just four months ago. It was really hard, <laughs> you know? Uh, you know, I, uh, there's no words that I could use to describe those feelings. And if it wasn't for Ellen, I don't, I don't think I could survive that you know, a year and a half outside of our house. One of the things that happened was the first thing to burn up in the garage were my clergy robes. <laughs> now, I'm not saying that's an omen, okay? <laughs> you know, um, my two robes were probably the first things to go because they're above where the fire started. And um, it, every worship service, basically, I wore my wor a clergy robe. And uh, we have a small house. That's why the robes are in the garage. And I figure I'm retired. I don't really need the robes. Um, but look, here I am back, you know, uh, for six months to be with you. And I don't have my clergy robes. And it's kind of like leaving your house without your phone. You know, it just feels a little awkward. And what was really, really awkward and a real huge change for me was to celebrate communion without wearing a clergy robe. I mean, it was just like, this is so against who I am. But I'm not going to go and spend, it's, 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 they're very expensive for six months. So I figured, well, I'm going to make the change. And so some changes come from within, and some changes come from out, you know, like the environment. You know, something, you know, causes us to make that change. And so last week we talked about change with Matthew 2. And uh, I am so grateful for Donna. She uh, ordered us these new markers. And uh, Facebook land, I need to know what color works well. Okay. Oh, okay, this is Matthew 2. And I'm going to put Matthew 28 over here. And what we, one of the things that we could see in that change was that the, the good guys were Gentiles and they were Magi. That's a huge change for the story in the Old Testament because the Old Testament was starting to move away from the covenant that they established with Abraham to be a blessing to all the world. And as we see... The end of Matthew ends with the Great Commission, which is to go to all the world and make disciples. That's a change. Okay. <clears throat> Last week, oh, did I hit that? Okay. <laughs> wow. Uh, last week, we talked about New Year's resolutions, and you were so grateful to turn in the New Year's resolutions. They're in here. Uh, I got a whole pile of them somewhere. There they are, right here. And I'm grateful for that. And one of you said the Lord's Prayer. And so I'm grateful for Pastor Elisha, who's going to lead us next week in pastoral prayer and Lord's Prayer. That is so important to me, you know. Uh, it's, I like the Lord's. Anybody like the Lord's Prayer? Okay, I like what Jane Casey said at the upper room, wherever she is. Is she here? Yeah, there she is. Okay. She, you said the Lord's Prayer was either, I can't remember what word, model or pattern for prayer. Do you remember saying that? 
You don't remember? You're being so profound. You should remember whenever you're profound, you should write it down. But you did say that. And I love that because to me, the Lord's Prayer is a pattern it's for prayer. It's, it's a, a model for prayer. It's, it's a way of like, I don't know how to pray. Go to the Lord's Prayer. Start off just praying that prayer. And then you can see what's going on with the Lord's Prayer. And so uh, I'm grateful that we're going to be doing the Lord's Prayer every Sunday. And as we do the Lord's Prayer, there will be some lines in the Lord's Prayer that are very important for us to pause on. And so I'm going to pause right here and take a look at this line. Thy kingdom come. When you pray thy kingdom come, what does that mean to you? Do you go, well, Lord, I'm, I'm hoping your kingdom comes, you know, uh, I got my own life, to, but I'm hoping your kingdom comes, and, uh, and I don't have anything involved in that. Or, when you pray that, do you go, you know, I should be involved in this process of thy kingdom come. Now, that sounds like a silly statement, but there are denominations that side with those, those two positions. There are denominations, and I don't mean to put denominations down. I'm not doing that. I'm just trying to say this is really an important question. There are some churches that when they pray thy kingdom come, feel like they've, all they have to do is pray about it, but they're not involved in that process. And then there are other denominations that say, we pray about God's kingdom coming, but we are also participants, and we are called to be involved. It's not just praying about it, but doing something about it. Why don't you think about that as we go through the book of Matthew, because Matthew answers that question. All right, so as we pray, thy kingdom come, the next line is thy will be done. Okay? Now, when you pray that, you go, well, God, I hope your will gets done. Or are you like me? God, you got your will, and I got my will. All right? God, you keep on doing your will, and I'll keep on doing my will, and you're good with that. Right, Lord? Or you like, I like C.S. Lewis. Anybody like C.S. Lewis? Okay, C.S. Lewis says this. I don't pray to change God's mind. I pray so that God can change my mind. You hear that? And so if I'm praying for God to change my mind, I'm praying that God will change my will. Are you with me on that? Thy will be done. When I'm praying that, I'm actually praying to God in the Lord's Prayer. Take this moment, Lord. Open my eyes. What is your will in my life? How should I be living? The next line, on earth as it is in heaven. Well, that kind of implies, doesn't it? That the kingdom and the will of God just doesn't stay in heaven. The kingdom and the will of God needs to be lived here on earth. And now. And so I'm, as I'm praying the Lord's Prayer, I realize in a sense, this is a weird statement, and you'll, you'll, you'll see where it's coming from, I have dual citizenship. Are you with me on that? Dual citizenship. I'm a, I'm a citizen in heaven. I think I could do this backwards. I'm also a citizen on earth. I could be taught. Heaven and earth. Who here has dual citizenship? Heaven and earth. Who here is going to end the world's collide? How many of you remember that movie? Anyone? All right. I like old movies. You'll hear more about it. Okay, here's our question this morning. John the Baptist. Was he adjusted? Or maladjusted. Just think about that for a moment. Gives me a chance to take another sip of water. How many say he was adjusted? How many say maladjusted? 
How many are waiting to see what unfolds? <laughs> All right, hang on to that. Okay. Some of you might be going, I don't care about John the Baptist. You know, I follow Jesus and not John the Baptist. Anybody here doing that? I can tell you what, I'm so grateful that we're going to be in Matthew 3 here shortly, but in Sunday school, they're in Matthew 4. And in Matthew 4, it says they're, they're talking about the disciples, the fishermen, following Jesus. They laid down their nets to follow Jesus. Sometimes we need to ask, what are we laying down to follow Jesus? Keep this in the back of your mind. Some of us are saying, I don't follow John the Baptist. He might be maladjusted, but I'm following Jesus. Well, if you're following Jesus, don't forget this passage that we're going to get to in a couple of months. Matthew 16, when Jesus says to the disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple, whoever wants to follow me must deny themselves and take up their cross. So what's happening is over there, they're talking about laying down nets. And maybe over here, we're, calling, we're talking about picking up the cross. Hang on to that for a bit. I'm just going to move through this faster. So take, if you have a Bible now, I invite you to turn to Matthew 3, and we're going to do some pictures. Okay, so as I do this picture, what do you see in this, in this passage right here? In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness. Where is he preaching? Wilderness. wilderness. I'm going to write wilderness right here. Here's John the Baptist. All right? And he's preaching. I'm going to put over here non-wilderness, but I'm going to use this word right here, establishment, because I'm a product of the 60s. All right? And over here, I'm going to ask the question, why is he in the wilderness? Get new people, and it's far from the establishment. I'm going to jump ahead and call him anti-establishment. Okay? All right. All right, just hang on to that for a bit. Some of you might go, what is he doing? All right, let's see what happens. And what was he doing out there? He was preaching, and he was saying what? Repent. So here's John the Baptist. He says, repent. I really like this Greek word. This Greek word, anybody in the uh, uh, previous military? Military people? No military people. We got one or two. Okay. Repent, in a sense, means about face. How many know about face? It actually means more than just about face, because about face is kind of like you do it, and then it's done. This word repent means more to like uh, to the rear march. Anybody know to the rear march? All right. So you're, you're marching like this, and then the instructor says to the rear march. It looks like an about face, but it keeps on moving. Are you with me on that? Because see, when he says repent, he doesn't mean like, okay, change once. It's a continual change, all right? And what this really means is you are going in the wrong direction. You are going into the wrong direction. You need a rear to the rear march. Are you with me on that? Because what's happening here is he's saying, if you keep on going the way you're going, what's going to happen? You're going to get lost, all right? And then you'll be able to sing Amazing Grace, Grace. You're going to get lost. All right. So he's telling these people, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Remember, we're dual citizenship. He's getting ready to get us to dual citizenship. We, uh, and then he, Matthew quotes Isaiah 40, verse 3. And this is why John is out there. A voice calling in the wilderness. He is preparing the way for what? Jesus, and I'm going to put, I like what someone said, kingdom, all right, and I'm putting it down there, okay, Facebook land, I need to know if the red works, I'm going back to the black, not for any other reason, just for color, <laughs> okay, all right, here we go, and now, John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist, his food was locusts and wild honey, 
What do you see in that passage? <laughs> I'm going to say he was the first hippie. Remember how we had, used to wear those leather belts? And uh, we didn't wear camels here, but we wore things like that. Does that sound anti-establishment to you? He's not eating in the fine restaurants. He's not wearing the fine clothes. He's eating natural food. Is John the Baptist adjusted or maladjusted? Would you invite this person to your next party? John, you don't have to bring any hors d'oeuvres. We got our own, own hors d'oeuvres. Lucas here. What's he doing? Hang on to that. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea. So here we got people coming. Here they're coming. All right. There they are. I was going to use that microphone here. All right. And what were they doing? They were confessing their sins and they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. Now, okay, let's just pause for a moment. How many think John the Baptist is anti-establishment? Raise your hand. Okay. Okay. How many say he was with the establishment? Nobody. All right. What was he doing out there? Baptism. Question, did John the Baptist invent baptism? Raise your hand. John the Baptist did not create baptism. Baptism is a sacred rite in Judaism. And in Judaism, when a Gentile wants to convert and become a Jew, they go through this whole process. I'm going to call it the cleansing process. And the last thing they do is they get baptized. Did you know that? Now, wait a minute. All of these people are Jews. There is not one Gentile out there. They are all Jews. John the Baptist is saying, repent and get baptized. And they're going to get baptized in what river? The Jordan. Notice this. When the chosen people return from exile in Egypt, they entered the promised land through the Jordan. This is how they got into the promised land. John the Baptist is out there bringing them back to the promised land through baptism. If you are clergy, I'm going to put the clergy over here, because they're the establishment, all right? What do you think is going on? Can you imagine this? On my first Sunday, which was last Sunday, I come to you, and I say to all of you, there is not one Christian in this room. Not one. You all need to become Christians. And you're all going to become Christians today by coming out here and repenting and being baptized. And the bishop would go, yeah, that's Stan. He's doing a great job. <laughs> I would be anti-establishment in a sense, you know, in relationship to the bishop, wouldn't I? Is John the Baptist anti-establishment. Is John the Baptist considered maladjusted by the establishment? Hang on to that. All right, so here comes the clergy. Uh, so there's the clergy, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They're coming uh, to where he was baptizing. And when John the Baptist saw the clergy, he says, great, I got 
reinforcements. Come on, guys, help me to do with all these baptisms. Is that what he said? What did he say? You brood of vipers. I really love it when somebody calls me a brood of viper. You're clergy. You're a brood of viper. Does that sound establishment or anti-establishment? Does that sound adjusted or maladjusted? Uh, I'm not touching that one. All right. As the sermon continues, or as the passage continues, it says, "Produce fruit." Where is your fruit? All right. Question mark. What would their fruit be looking like according to John the Baptist? What kind of fruit was he looking at when he saw the clergy representing the establishment? Okay. And do you think you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father? Remember last week when we talked about the Abrahamic covenant? This is important now. It was important last week. It's important now. The Abrahamic covenant is that God entered a relationship through Abraham with the chosen people for the chosen people, these folks over here, the establishment, to be a blessing for all the world. And in the book of Matthew, what we find is that the establishment or the clergy or Israel was not being a blessing to all the world, and that's the fruit that they weren't producing. That fruit, that blessing, Jesus sends the followers, the disciples, to fulfill through the Great Commission in Matthew 28, how this book ends. You know, we have Abraham as our father. We're good. And John the Baptist is saying, no, you didn't pray thy will be done. So there's Abraham. So and then the axe is near the tree and it's going to get cut. And then John the Baptist says, I baptize you with water for repentance. But after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. And he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Who's he talking about? Jesus. That's what you just said. Somebody talk about Jesus. All right. Okay, so here, here's your question. Is John the Baptist going rogue? If, if a minister did this today, you would say they were going rogue. You would say they were anti-establishment. I said confront the empire because I like Star Wars. <laughs> okay. All right. John the Baptist is more here than here. Wouldn't you agree? John the Baptist, in a sense, according to culture at that time, was more here than here. Would you agree to that? Okay, hang on to that for a bit. All right. Um, Tomorrow is Dr. Martin Luther King's birthday, or when we celebrate it. I can't remember exactly what day it is, but somewhere around now. How many remember that? Okay. Tomorrow it is. Uh, Office is closed, but I think Donna's still going to be there, right? Yay, Donna! She wears a super cape. All right. So, um, it's a tradition of mine on this Sunday to share. I used to preach a whole sermon of Dr. King's, but I can't do that anymore because I'm not as energetic as the choir, and it takes a lot of energy to do it. But I want to share with you a couple of words from one of his sermons that he preached in 1956. He preached it more than just once, but one of the times he preached it was in 56. And it's called Paul's Letter to the American Church. And it's uh, an imaginary letter. Uh, if Paul was to write a letter to the American church, what would it sound like? And so uh, Dr. King uh, preached this sermon in 56, kind of like sharing some of his ideas of what it would sound like. And uh, he begins to... Uh, uh, the, the, the letter to the American church, kind of like the letter in Romans. You know, it's kind of like talking about, and a lot of his, how many knew that uh, Paul is responsible for like one third of the New Testament? Maybe even half, okay? So, but a lot of times Paul begins with this kind of idea of, you know, I heard of your good works and stuff like that. And so in, in Dr. King's sermon, he, you know, he's pretending to be Paul, 
He says, I've heard of the fascinating and astounding advancements you made in the scientific and material realm. This is 1956. <laughs> I'm at that point in my life where I talk about that a lot. Do you know what I'm talking about? You know, it's like we get together with you know, people my age, you know, and we get together and you go, I remember when dialing a phone meant really dialing. Uh, you know what I'm talking about? I think that dial phone was made by the devil. Do you know why? Because whenever I dialed, my heart would beat faster and faster when I got closer to the last number because sometimes my finger would slip. Anybody remember that? It happened too many times, and I'd have to start all over, okay? Uh, you know, advent of microwaves, or, or the microwave oven, and, uh, and TV has changed. A lot of things have changed scientifically and also in the material realm. Don't, who agrees with that? I mean, we have seen lots of changes, okay? And sometimes I talk too much about them with my grandchildren, He's talking about that stuff again, all right? But America, I'm wondering, as I look at you from afar, whether or not you have gone as far in the spiritual and moral realm. Is that a great question? I mean, when you look at the progress of the last, even just the last 30 years, I mean, we have jumped, I mean, 40 years ago, nobody had a computer in their house. And now we don't leave home without one. Right? We have made great spiritual, I mean, uh, <laughs> material advances. But what about spiritual and moral advances? Have we made giant leaps in the spiritual and moral realm? Some people might say yes. And some people might say no. And Dr. Conti uh, King continues, though your scientific genius, through your scientific genius, you have been able to make the world a neighborhood. We, we have different ways of saying that now, but he used the word neighborhood. But through your moral and spiritual genius, you have failed to make it a brotherhood. How, how many can see Dr. King saying this? I mean, he had a way with words. Neighborhood, yeah, but not a brotherhood. And then, in the sermon, he gets to this point. Even in the churches, they give their ultimate allegiance to the patterns of this world. Is he asking a good question? He was asking this in 1956. Is this still a good question today? Is this a question that we can go, patterns of this world, are the churches in alignment with that? He continues by saying, they want to be accepted socially. They are afraid to be ostracized. And so they conform to the patterns of this world. He said that in 1956. Can we say it in 24? You know, um, kind of one of my pet peeves about the church being ostracized, you know, it's like a lot of times when they're doing a sitcom or a movie and they're going, man, we need a joke here. Bring in the Christian, right? You know? And so, and then he says, America, May I say to you, as I said to the Roman church, the book of Romans, be ye not conformed to this world, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Is that a great passage? That's a great passage. Should the church kind of like open Romans 12 too every so often and take a look at it? Maybe use it as a New Year's resolution. Maybe think about it when we're praying, thy will be done. You have a dual citizenship. Now you know where that came from. All right? You have a twofold citizenship. Not only are you a citizen of this world, but also of another world. You live in both in time and eternity, both in heaven and earth. 
Anybody thinking King, uh, uh, Lord's Prayer right now? Even though you live in the common of time, you must always take your orders from the empire that created time. Interesting, isn't it? And now this is where these words come from. I have read some of your psychology. I have seen you talk a lot about maladjusted and adjusted. Certainly no one wants to be maladjusted. We want to be adjusted. Now these are kind of archaic words right now, maybe. Okay? But it's 1956. And in 1956, most people wanted to be considered adjusted. Right? Right? No one wants to walk around being thinking of themselves as maladjusted. But America, I want to call upon you, if you are going to be followers of Christ, then you must be maladjusted. Isn't that an interesting statement? In an age that is amazingly adjusted to hate and malice, That's 1956. Are we amazingly adjusted to hate and malice? I have some really good friends. And in the last election, I mean, these, they're, they're in, one of them has passed away since. They're in their, um, their 90s. Really nice people. Really gentle spiritual, and they voted for Donald Trump. And you know what happened? A lot of their friends unfriended them on Facebook and said a lot of mean things about them. And it's not just that one subject area, but I see a lot of hatred in social media. I see a lot of malice going on in social media. It's like, it's almost dangerous to get out there. Am, am I the only one that thinks that? Or is there anybody else here that thinks there's a lot of anger in the social media realm? And we're kind of used to it, I think. He says if we're in an age that is amazingly adjusted to hate and malice, then he wants to be considered maladjusted. Who here is with Dr. King? Anybody? America, may I say to you, as I said to the Roman church, be ye not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your minds. How do you transform your mind? Well, we're going to embark on a journey through the Gospel of Matthew. We're going to be experiencing this maladjusted and adjusted in the book of Matthew because Matthew calls the adjusted people, the establishment, the clergy, those who are not producing fruit, those who have failed the covenant and not been a blessing, to see and hear the message of John as he prepares the way for Jesus and for Jesus to proclaim his message of the kingdom is now and that we must change. Because if we don't get change, we will get lost. If we don't realize that sometimes what we considered adjusted may actually be maladjusted, and what some things in the Gospel of Matthew that seem maladjusted may actually be adjusted. Let me close with this one true story. This takes place a couple of decades ago. And there was this uh, test pilot in a jet fighter plane. And they're flying this jet fighter plane at incredible speeds, doing all these incredible stunts and and all kinds of things that would make me vomit if I was in the plane. Okay? And then they decided, I'm going to take a steep ascent. They ran into the ground. They hit the earth. Why? Because they thought they were flying upside, but they were really flying downside. They were upside down in that plane. And when you're upside down and you're thinking you're going up, you will hit the earth. Sometimes I wonder if we need to hear that message in our own lives. And we need to hear the message that if we are 
thinking we are upside or right side and we think we are adjusted and we want to ascend, we might hit the earth. Because in actuality, we need to change. We need to repent. Because if we don't, we shall surely be lost. Let us pray. Oh Lord, I love the song Amazing Grace. And in the book of Matthew, especially in the 15th chapter, we need an epiphany. We need a wake-up call. Because sometimes we could be truly lost and we think we are living life the right way. Because it seems like everybody's doing it. It's socially accepted. It's a de-adjusted life. But sometimes we need somebody who is wild and crazy to enter our life and tell us to repent. To tell us to prepare our lives in such a way that that change, that continual change, that, that laying down of our fishing nets and picking up that cross to follow you. Help us, O oh Lord, to reflect, to take time this week, to take time tomorrow, because a lot of us won't be working tomorrow, to take time and to ask, where am I going? And is it the place where I should be going? Am I praying thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven through my words and through my life? We ask this in Jesus' name.